Well, if you are a, fir a first-time visitor here or you've been returning, Ricky's on in Santa Barbara right now. He is doing uh, a wedding for a, a, a really personal family friend. So, um, um, and they'll be actually traveling here back tomorrow. So they were gone over the weekend. So you're stuck with me today. <laughs> Hey, listen, um, we're going to be um, revisiting our Great Chapters of the Bible series. And we, uh, several weeks ago, opened up Ephesians chapter 6, and we looked at part 1 of a two-part study instructing us on the whole armor of God. Do you remember that? Who was with us on that week? A lot of you were here. In our, in our time together, we looked at how this armor enabled us to walk in the light of Christ, specifically within our relationships, within the reality of the world we live in, and why this is the responsibility of every believer. So to refresh our memories, we asked the big question, what makes Ephesians chapter 6 such a great chapter? Why should we cling to the heart of its message pertaining to relationships, reality, and responsibility? Well, to answer that, we took a brief 30,000-foot assessment. Let me summarize. In Ephesians, we discovered from a broader viewpoint that it instructs and challenges all believers in key doctrinal truth. And it also instructs us in our responsibility and duty to perform those. Okay. We learned that many scholars and theologians felt that this was Paul's greatest writing because it encompassed a succinct yet broad summary of the good news and its implications. William Barclay wrote, it's the divinest composition of man, the queen of the epistles. Isn't that great? And it's here in chapter 6 where Paul melds our day-to-day -day relationships within the framework of Christian awareness and responsibility. It's a stunning balance between doctrine and duty, practicality and reality, reminding us that we are part of God's master plan, which includes the cosmic, supernatural, unseen world. And we're going to talk about that a little bit this morning. For those of you who joined us in part one, we looked exclusively at the area of relationships. We explored what our God-ordained roles should look like in them. We challenged husbands and wives. We challenged children. We challenged parents. And we challenged employees and businessmen. We learned why mutual submission and sacrifice functioning seamlessly together is paramount in God's economy. You see, relationships fully armored and lived out according to God's tried and true blueprint are key to successful parenting. They're key to successful marriages. It's key to being a light in our community, isn't it? So these god honoring relationships, although not always perfect, we learn should be fun, infectious, coveted, victorious, and feared by the enemy. And not just for our benefit, but also for those onlookers who have yet to see Christ in their lives. So this morning we're going to look at part two of our study. And we'll be looking at the reality of our spiritual world and why it's the responsibility of every believer to incorporate God's full armor into our daily lives. So are you ready? All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word today. Lord, we're grateful for it. Lord, we want to cherish it. We don't want to take it for granted. Lord, our world seems to be turning upside down right before our very eyes. Lord, the things that we never thought we could imagine are happening. And so, God, we need your word. We need your instruction. So, Lord, I'm asking for, Lord, us to be tuned in. Lord, to be captivated by your word, to study it, to meditate on it. And, Lord, do your work through us, Lord, as you see fit. Bless this time now in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Well, we pick up our text in verse 10 of chapter 6. And it's here on the heels of relationships where Paul begins to close out this brilliant letter. He begins this passage with a simple statement. He says, finally. In other words, faithful Ephesians and Kumalani believers, because of all that I've told you leading up to this point, I need your complete attention and focus for what is next. So he starts verse 10 by saying, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, 
against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will be standing firm. Wow. What a section of scripture. What a reality check. It is a precursor. It's important for us to pause and consider what the original readers must have been thinking when they read these verses. Here, they were caught up in the magnificence of Paul's original thought. Then out of nowhere, this sudden shift in the subject occurs. It's safe to say that this may have come, this may have come as a jolt to them. And it may be coming a jolt to you this morning. Keep in mind, through the course of this letter, Paul's expose on doctrine and duty has opened them up to the bright secrets of grace, the mystery of their election, the wonder of their salvation and spiritual resurrection, the celebration of divine power in their lives, their heavenly position, their peace, their unity, and their giftedness. In addition, and as we discovered in part one, their privileged call to live as God's light, filled with his Holy Spirit, fulfilling God's beautiful order of mutual submission and sacrifice as husbands and wives, parents and children, and employees and employers. These are all grand thoughts, substance worthy of a dreamy reflection, aren't they? Kind of like a beautiful sunset at Napili Bay. Mmm, look at that. Some of you are going to be there tonight. Or how about a perfect wave at Honolulu? For you surfers, that's pretty dreamy. And for you foodies, how about an extra large slice of hula pie from Chemo's? That's creamy and dreamy. And then, bam! Right out of nowhere, Paul abruptly interjects this ugly reality of war with the devil. Really, Paul? Wow! This isn't so dreamy anymore. Our illusions have just been intersected. But church, this is our spiritual reality. And according to scripture, this is no secret to the heavens, nor should it surprise us. You see, the struggle here is not new. In fact, its origin dates all the way back to the Garden of Eden. It's there that Satan first tempted man to disobey God's instructions and perfect plan for existence. Although his tactics succeeded then, and the spiritual struggle for humanity remains ever present today, we can be thankful for God's grace and merciful in his redemptive plan through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Can't we? Amen. Amen to Jesus. The fact is, despite this reality, we are still called to live out these beautiful God-given lives, even while camped out on the banks of the enemy's dismal territories. It's here between the original fall of man and our future redemption that we are called to bridge the gap and stay the course to the glory of God. You guys, we have a mission. God has us on a mission. In life, God's master plan can be hard to comprehend. This is why Paul is so intent to protect us through diligent reminders of his word. So we can never rest on our spiritual laurels, remaining alert and functioning as God's ambassadors, forging ahead despite life struggles. This passage is a necessary reminder for those who want to live out this Ephesian vision in today's modern world. Is that your goal today? You see, unfortunately, this prevailing philosophy in our modern culture leaves little room for God's supernatural work or anything without a physical cause for that matter. Sadly, many Christians today are so influenced by this thinking that even though they give conscious voice to their belief in Satan and spiritual warfare, their lives show no evidence of this certainty. And that's sad. Church, this reminder needs to be a wake-up call and that will not only rekindle our intellect, but also motivate us to godly living. Amen to that? So let's be honest. At face file, these, verse, these verses are uncomfortable. They just are. But this is the reality of the world we live in, both secular and spiritual. And it's very important that we come to grips with this, and the sooner the better. Okay? There's an ongoing spiritual battle raging for the souls of mankind. It's just that simple. Team, this is what we do know. Let me spell this out for you. 
we have an er adversary. His name is the devil. He has minions that follow him and make no bones about it. He has a clear strategy. John 10.10 10 states, the thief comes only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Jesus actually made that statement. And in 1 Peter 5.8, we are warned, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Wow, that's real. I'm also reminded here of Jesus' conversation with Peter where he reasoned with him saying, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. Wow. Friends, although this may be the enemy's goal, the reality is it's not God's goal. Isn't that great? Paul just exhorted us to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. You see, despite the enemy's tactics, God has provided us with full protection and power offered exclusively through our Lord and, Je Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful? Did you realize that this is one of your spiritual blessings in Jesus? And you can hang on this every day. In part one of this study, we looked at the first blessing Paul spoke over his faithful followers at Ephesus. In fact, he opened this letter asking that we would be full of God's grace and peace. Do you remember that? Wasn't that great? But see, his prayer didn't end there. It actually continued. And in verse 19 through 22, to make my point, he says, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. Wow, gang, that should get you excited. What a passage. You mean as believers, we benefit, we benefit from the same power that we raised Christ from the dead? That our assurance is in Jesus who is far above any ruler, any authority, any leader, or anything else on this world for that matter? The answer is yes. That's unbelievable. Friends, this is an amazing promise of security. You see, church, it was Christ's life, sacrifice, death, and resurrection that solidified his power and supremacy over everything. And God in his amazing grace and mercy safeguards his church and protects those who call upon him in spirit and in truth with this same power. Isn't that awesome? It's the simple process of confession, repentance, and inviting him into our lives as Lord and Savior that qualifies us as benefactors of this power. And maybe this morning you haven't made that decision yet. And your life is feeling powerless. But guess what? You can make that call today. And God's going to be there just like that. Now as we continue, I'd like to examine three characteristics of the enemy. And as I reread these verses in 11 and 12, please keep in mind this power that we just discussed from Paul's prayer. Verse 11 says, Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood, that is key, gang, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Our first characteristic of the enemy. Number one, they are powerful, okay? Satan and his host of demons are referred, to, referred here as the mighty powers or rulers in this dark world. The reality is they are permitted to rule over their domain of darkness. They have a hall pass there. In fact, 1 John chapter 5, verse 19 states, the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. But team, who is more powerful? Jesus is. Who overcame sin and darkness on our behalf? Who holds the victory? And who do you belong to? Amen. Hold on to that. 1 John 4, 4 reminds us that you are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is of the world. Okay? 
Observation number two, this is heating up. Paul reminds us that they are evil and wicked. You see, power is a neutral resource. It's either used well or it's misused. Our spiritual enemy chooses to use their power destructively for evil and not for good. They hate the light. They shrink from darkness. Darkness and deeds are their natural habitat. It's a place of falsehood and sin. And make no mistakes, friends, evil and dark influences are alive and well on planet Earth. Just turn on the evening news. Church, I never thought in my lifetime that I would witness the destructive reality of so much demonic influence and influenced actions and activity represented in our culture today. And it appears to be escalating at a rapid pace, right in line with biblical prophecy. But we are called to be lights in this darkness, aren't we? Our lives must reflect Christ in this dark world. John 1.5 affirms that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. Did you realize that? Your light can never be extinguished unless you allow it to through disobedience. It's like turning on the light switch in a dark room. Switch on, darkness gone. It's just that instantaneous. It's not until the light switch is turned off that darkness can return. Did you get that? So who's in control? Who holds the power source? Remember, your bright witness for Christ is a powerful tool in this spiritual battle against evil forces, and the devil knows it. This is why Jesus in Matthew 5 calls us to be like a city on a hilltop that can't be hidden. I love this. And that we should let our light so shine before men that they may see your good works in what? Glorify your Father in heaven. See, God, that's our goal. No matter what's going on in our society today, no matter what decisions are coming down from the judicial level, God's still calling us to be enthusiastic, God-fearing, encouraging people of God. Okay? See, that's our agenda. That's our platform, to be about Christ's business, not to be sidetracked and consumed. Okay? The third characteristic is, they are cunning. This should come as no surprise. Paul refers to their actions here as the strategies or wiles of the devil. Keep in mind, his trickeries take many forms. Not all come under the guise of blatant evil. They are often masqueraded as an enticing offer or temptation that can appear harmless and at first and worth a second look. But the goal of his is always the same. He wants to trap you. He wants to kill you, steal from you, and try to destroy you if he can. But in the power of Christ, we know that he can't. This is why we must always be prepared and keep alert. Team, as the ruler of planet Earth and chief marketing strategist, Satan has systematically invaded our media, distracted our allegiance via a variety of global platforms, glamorized its ethical decay under the clever guise of science, technology, free speech, tolerance, intelligence, equality, sexuality, self-independence, and religious freedom. All the while using an appealing star-studded cast of celebrities, leaders, organizations, and a sleeping church as his networks and his conduits. All the while dismantling our spiritual, our spiritual, judicial, and educational systems and rewriting the playbook of a once morally vibrant, God-fearing society. Church, our enemy is calculated and he is cunning. And after all these portrayals, do you know what his greatest ploy is? This might come as a surprise. His greatest ploy is convincing people that he just simply doesn't exist. To deny his reality is to expose ourselves to more of his subtlety. Dr. Lloyd-Jones expressed his conviction in the following terms. He says, I am certain that one of the main causes of the ill state of the church today is the fact that the devil is being forgotten. Churches just don't preach about it anymore. Friends in life, especially relationships, we are faced with daily challenges, responsibilities, and spiritual opposition. They can happen in a moment's notice and often simultaneously. It's during these difficult times that our allegiances are tested and oftentimes exposed. 
It's in the trial where a passive, a passive approach might seem more appealing. If I just ignore my surroundings, the issues, allow a little compromise here or there, or if I just go on with the status quo, then maybe life's pressures, pressures will just subside or maybe just disappear. Gang, that's exactly what Satan wants. So Paul doesn't tell us here to overlook or shirk our spiritual calling and obligations. Instead, he commands us firmly to be strong. Your translation might read, stand firm. Your obedience to your marriages, your children, your families, and your public witness are far too important to ignore. Eternal souls are weighing in the balance. They need us. We need them. And team, we need each other to finish the race, don't we? When we think of this unseen conflict Paul illustrates here, we can often equate it with a distant, concealed battlefield, a fictitious place that we can simply tune into or tune out of at our discretion, a far, far away place where our seemingly insignificant decisions have no real bearing or consequence. Well, that can't be farther from the truth. The reality is, is that the battlefield is right in front of us. We walk on it every day. And we are called to be engaged in it. The question is, do we see it? Are we present and accounted for? Are we ready for the battle? Do we know who we are fighting against? And do we know who we are fighting for? Team, it's our relationships, our family, our friends and community that are on the line. And aren't they worth fighting for? Are they worth it? Well, Jesus thinks so. In John chapter 3, verse 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You guys, this is just our temporary home. Somewhere along the line, we've started to set a perm try to set a permanent camp here. But we have to pack loosely. We have to hold on loosely. And we have to be ready at a moment's notice because heaven's going to be wonderful. We sang about it this morning. It's going to be great. Well, how do we combat this enemy, this unseen foe? What should our strategy look like? Well, it starts with us simply taking responsibility. This whole idea of putting on the full armor of God and enabling us to walk in the light of Christ within these relationships and the reality of the spiritual world, well, it starts with us. It starts with you and me, doesn't it? So as we reach the final leg of our study this morning, Paul outlines our remedy and fir firmly charges us in verse 13 to therefore put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will be standing firm. Wow, what a promise. See, verse 13 here, it's an action verse, okay? No passiveness allowed. It's also not subjective either we simply can't pick and choose here so what paul is saying is it's our responsibility to put on every single piece but notice the twofold blessing and i love this by putting our responsibilities into action number one i hope you notice this we'll be able to resist evil when tempted gang temptations they're going to come and for some of you they're going to come today but number two, when the battles subside, you will be left standing firm in God's power. Wow, what an assurance. So Paul lays out in military fashion a list of these non-negotiable elements. Remember, it was Paul in his present day surrounding that inspired his imagery here. He was chained in prison. He was actually surrounded by armed guards. And the elements of our weaponry, of their weaponry, were on full display for him to see every day. So you can see why he equated these together. But these elements are the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and prayer. Please note, and it's important for us to remember that these seven elements, they were all created by God. These aren't things that we can stir up in our own intellect, in our self-righteousness. 
See, God is the architect and our creator. He knows exactly what we need. It's only when we are equipped with God's full armor through Jesus Christ that we can actually truly stand. And God knew this. Each aspect of this symbolic armor, it answers to a specific dynamic within the Christian life that enables us to stand firm against spiritual attacks. So God provided us with these supernatural resources, all with a distinct design and benefit. Now, as a side note here, I love this. Paul was very perceptive of his captors. When he was in chains, the, he noticed that the order in which these pieces of armor are described here is the same order, order in which the soldier would normally put them on. You see, there was a priority placement here in this armory. So Paul here first asks us in verse 14 to stand your ground putting on the belt of truth. Isn't that amazing? It's no mystery that Paul introduces truth as the primary tool all the other armor is going to be linked to. When a soldier tightened his belt, he was ready for battle. Without clenching ourselves tightly with truth and scripture, the other weapons of our war warfare will clatter in disarray. The belt of truth represents all the biblical beliefs and solid doctrine of the Christian faith. It's the foundation we must live upon all times. And in fact, in Ephesians 4.21, Paul refers to it as the truth that is in Jesus. Church, there is objective spiritual truth in Christ and his scriptures. Truth about God, truth about ourselves, about history and the future. You see, it's the truth of God that will protect us and ensure victory in our lives. Without it, we don't stand a chance. Well, how important is truth to you today, I guess, is the question. It was so important that Jesus interceded for his disciples in John 17 while he prayed, sanctify them by truth. Your word is truth. The words from our Savior. See, society today, it seems, has lost its way. As our culture has distanced itself from God's truth, the moral ramifications have been devastating. The Bible encourages us here to not lean our own, on our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge him. Scripture also says, you will know the truth and the church will set you free. Church, our world is in shackles. It is in desperate need of authentic church. Not the world's version of truth, but God's truth lived out through you. Friends, I have a question and a request. Would you join me today in committing your daily lives filled up and directed by God's truth? Would you do that? Paul continues. He says, stand your ground, putting on the whole armor of God's righteousness. Your translation might say the breastplate. He calls it here the body armor. For the, for the soldier, righteousness is presented as this element of warfare called the breastplate. And its essential connection provided protection of their most vital organs. See, they wore it from the top of their belt all the way underneath their neck and it went all the way over their shoulders. It still left them with mobility, but it protected them. But one of the most important organs that it protected was their hearts. God's righteousness in the life of the believer is equally critical. We cannot successfully battle against spiritual enemies and our own virtue any more than a soldier can successfully fight without his breastplate on. You see, gang, the word righteousness equals defined acting in accord with divine or moral law or to be free from guilt or sin. What a great definition. In other words, we are free and deemed righteous because of the redemptive work of Jesus. All that we have and all that we are is because of what Christ has done. This is what theologians call imputed righteousness. If you don't have it, nothing can save you. But if you do, you are safe for all eternity. Isn't that amazing? 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He became sin who knew no sin, that we might become what? His righteousness. Team, we, when we put on God's virtue, we are putting on Jesus. And in so doing, we begin to develop and manifest his character through honorable living. 
Such a life is not only secure, but it is filled with his power. Church, I'm going to ask you again. Will you partner with me today in putting on God's righteousness? This precious gift. Would you let that ignite you this week? Would you remember what Jesus did for you? Will you join me in that? The next item described by Paul here are the shoes of peace. And it says in verse 15, for shoes put on, for shoes put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. Oh, I love these. You see, these shoes were made of thick leather and had nails sticking out through the bottom. It almost looked like a glorified sandal. They provided a stable platform and traction in the midst of battling against the enemy. But it provided the soldier that firmness and that foundation that he needed. Friends, don't our lives need the same stability and traction that peace provides in our world today? Of course they do. Notice where peace comes from here. The scripture says it comes from the good news. This is a new term to you. Maybe you're not a church goer. This simply means it comes from the word of God. Our time in scripture is necessary and vital. It's God's word that reminds us, that reproves us, that restores us, and that refreshes us. We just need it. Team, life has real pressure and responsibilities, but a life filled with the word has discernment, stability, clear direction, and ultimately peace. These are vital ingredients for our marriages, our spouses, our parents, our ministers, and our businessmen. We've got to have them. Philippians 4 reminds us it's God's perfect peace that will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. His perfect peace. These shoes also had a second role. They represented our roles as ambassadors. We must be prepared each day to share this gospel of peace. If we wear these shoes of the gospel, then we have the beautiful feet that are described in Isaiah 52, verse 7. Let me quote this. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Pretty important truth, aren't they? Very important. So church, I want to ask you to partner with me again today. Do you think our footwear is in need of a little upgrade? Well, let's put on those shoes of peace today. Let's be ready in and out of season with God's word. Let's be ready to share it with an unsaved world, but also use it to fortify the relationships that God's given us. Amen to that? In addition to all of these, our fourth piece of armor here, Paul says, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. You see, in Paul's day, this shield was a large, movable object. It was made of leather and heavy metal, and it was engineered to withstand spears, darts, and the infamous fiery arrows of the devil. These actually were about two feet wide and about four feet tall. This shield served both as individual armor, but when lined up shoulder to shoulder with fellow soldiers, they could link them together to create a massive linear wall of protection. I love that picture. This suggests that we as Christians are not in this battle alone. You see, the faith mentioned here is not saving faith, but rather living faith. It's an active trust in the promises of the power of God. Faith is a defensive weapon as well, which protects us. When the enemy shoots fiery darts at our hearts and minds via lies, hates, doubt, and desire for sin, if we don't by faith quench these darts, then we will light a fire within and sin will ensue and we will disobey God. So it's safe to say that during our earthly life, we will face thousands of blazing arrows flying at us in various forms. But the answer is, is faith and will always be faith. The apostle John wrote, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Isn't that amazing? That's a powerful tool, isn't it? Faith binds us in a vital, deep union with God. Faith is not just belief, it's belief plus trust. It is resting in the person of God and in his word. Team, again, will you join me today to pick up our shields and commit this week to trust God by faith in every circumstance. Would you do that with me? 
Good. We're winding down here. We're now asked to put on the salvation as your helmet. I love this next piece of armor. One of the key tactics of the enemy is to attack your mind, especially as it relates to our eternal promises. That is why God wants us to protect it. No soldier's uniform was complete without a proper helmet. The Roman's helmet protected the forehead, the cheeks, and extended down the back of the neck. It gave full protection, and when it was strapped in place, it exposed only the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. You see, their head was fully protected, and it was secure. And that's what salvation does for us. Now, let's consider this helmet of salvation. And I want you to remember, it was actually placed on our heads by the nail-pierced hands of Christ at the moment of our conversion. You see, your salvation came with a heavy price. We must never forget or be coerced to think differently. Ephesians 2.8 says, For it has been grace, it's by grace that you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it's the free gift of God. This helmet also provides optimism. It assures us that no matter what happens in this life, we will be saved and experience victory in Christ. Amen to that? Philippians 1.6 says, Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it out to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. Friends, salvation, our future hope in heaven, should drive us and motivate us to godly living. Together, let's rekindle this hope of salvation and let it change the way we live. Would you do that with me this week? Okay, I like it. So Paul concludes his imagery of military armor by asking us to take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This sword of the Spirit is unique because it's the first weapon put forth which is primarily offensive, although it still aids defensively. This was a short, double-edged sword that was used for close-in fighting. It was carefully secured to the belt, providing quick lightning access. So Paul here equates this secure, sharp, and effective weapon with the Word of God, and I love this. We are reminded in Hebrews that the word of God slices through the human spirit like a hot, hot knife through butter. In fact, the, the fourth chapter, verse 12 says, the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirits, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and intentions of the heart. You see, this strategic metaphor of the sword and the word should be a reminder to all of us the importance of being ready at a moment's notice to quickly bring forth the word of God and let it have its way in the hearts of people. You see, when we take up God's word, we have the weapon par excellence, I like to call it, for both defensive and offensive battle. During this duel between Christ and Satan in the desert, remember that out of Matthew 4? Satan made three efforts to tempt Jesus. And in each of these temptations, Jesus successfully deflected them by what? By quoting scripture. That was his most powerful tool. In the midst of temptation, he just quoted scripture. Good model for us to follow, isn't it? We must also heed the example of the psalmist to hide God's word in our hearts that we may not sin against him. Moses said of God's word, they are not just idle words for you, they are your life. Team, we need God's word. We have to have it. Starting today, let's commit to taking up God's word to our heart. Letting it penetrating into the deepest parts of our soul. Changing us and molding, it, molding us. Well, how can we do this? Well, first of all, we've got to read the Bible. We need to pick it up. We need to spend time in it. And while we're reading it, let's actually study it. Let's meditate on it. Let's memorize scripture so we're ready for the battle. And then most importantly, when the opportune time comes, we can then share the gospel. People need to hear the truth, don't they? And it's our job to give it to them. Well, church, Paul concludes this wonderful thread by, encouraging, by encouragement with our final piece of armor. He encourages us all to simply pray. We find this in verse 18. 
This is our final piece of armor, my friends. Pray in the Spirit at all times. And on every occasion, stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. And pray for me too. Ask God to give me the right words so I can boldly explain his mysterious plan that the good news is not only for the Jews and the Gentiles alike. He says, I am now in chains, still preaching this message as God's ambassadors. So pray that I will keep on speaking boldly for him as I should. I love Paul's heart here. I've loved his heart through this whole book. He really does love those who love God. And he loves the unsaved even more. He's a man who intently wants to communicate the clarity of Scripture so we can all have that inheritance that comes through Jesus Christ. So when this is all said and done and life is completely over, we will be in heaven for all eternity, together worshiping God. Gang, that's going to be an amazing day. But we have to bridge that gap. We have to stay the course. James says that the fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Spurgeon said, prayer is the key to our day and the lock to our night. Jesus told us to pray without ceasing. We need to be intentional when we pray. We need to be purposed when we pray. And most importantly, we need to be consistent when we pray. Prayer is the catalyst to this whole armament that we've just discussed. Well, team, these elements, this complete package of God's armor are amazing gifts from our Lord. They are offered freely and are available to us every day. The benefits are eternal. We should cherish them, have them polished and ready for the battle. We must put these into action, model them in our marriages, teach them to our children, showcase them to our families and communities, use them effectively to bring salvation to the unsaved. Why? Because there is a battle and it's real and it's raging over the eternal destinies of mankind. The devil knows that a Christian, firm in his or her faith, effective in the relationships, filled with power and delight in the community is a direct threat to his agenda. For a world that Jesus paid a dear price for, let's take our rightful position in Christ and let's partner with him in obedient living to make a spiritual impact in our world. Let's leave an indelible mark of truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation, committed to his word and prayer. And in so doing, you will have a profound effect in the lives that surround you each and every day. It's the full armor of God that enables us to walk in the light of Christ within our relationships and in the reality of the world we live in. And because of this, we need to take the responsibility and simply put it on. Gang, are you going to put on that armor this week? We need to, don't we? The world is heating up. Things seem to be spinning out of control. The unimaginable is happening right before our eyes. We need to be ready in and out of season, serving faithfully, diligently, enthusiastically, with smiles on our face, loving Jesus and loving others. Amen. Lord, we thank you for this morning. God, I know this has been a tough passage. It's been very direct. And Lord, that's why this is such a great chapter of the Bible. Because it talks about strategic things that really matter relationships that really matter. A spiritual world that is real and exists. Lord, thank you for equipping us. Thank you for giving us things that we need, this spiritual armor which is called here in the word. Thank you for allowing us to have access to it. Thank you for never leaving us or forsaking us. Aren't you glad, church? So Lord, we're thankful. We just love you this morning. Amen. Let's all stand as we sing this last song.